So open your eyes right now if you're listening to this and you don't believe it. Uh, you know, I know that there's a, the cool thing is there this, and I don't think this guy realizes what he's doing, but there's a whole nother channel with this witch that takes all our shows and puts them up. And the whole time we're doing them, he tries to dog us out. If you're listening to this guy's show right now, listen to what I'm saying. Forget what this guy is saying about us and listen to what I'm saying right now, because guess what? Witch or not, you're going to end up in a bad shape. <laughs> just forget the pictures because it just... <laughs> Technical difficulties. I feel you. I feel you, David. Because if they're not in order, it just isn't going to work. So let's just go on and get into the material. David, are you wearing a garbage bag, or is that like a really shiny leather vest? And uh, I can do it without the pictures. There he is. There he is. There he is. There's William Q. Judge. And uh, what I want to do is give a little historical progression to the conspiracy. How about actually giving some truth and some factual evidence for the conspiracy, David? And we're going to begin in the 1800s, in the period after the Civil War, with the founding of the Theosophical Society. And I thought it might be good to let you actually see some of these people and make it a little more real for us. The Theosophical Society is real. The founders are real. You don't have to make it any more real for anyone, David. It's real. People can look it up for themselves. There's, matter of fact, there's a link below to the Theosophical Society, and people can find out about who these people are and what they actually believe for themselves. And uh, this man, William Q. Judge, was a Freemason. No, he was not a Freemason. And he was heavily steeped into the occult. And he came together with another man by the name of Henry Steele Alcott. And he is that rascally fellow with the beard. If you could bring him up, John. What exactly makes him rascally looking? Is it the beard? The beard makes him rascally looking? If that's the case, Bill Schnoblin is a very rascally looking person. The, the fellow with the beard, big bushy beard. And these two fellows came together uh, he was also very much involved in writing esoteric texts on Eastern mysticism, and he was also a Freemason. No, he was not a Freemason. And these two gentlemen came together with a lady by the name of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, and she also was a Freemason. No, she was not a Freemason. And we were talking not long ago on one of our broadcasts, how that many people think that there are no women Freemasons. Well, here in America, we have the Order of the Eastern Star, and there is in Grand Orient Freemasonry with the charter off the Lodge Adroit Humane in Paris, France, what is called co-masonry. And this Saturday night, we'll have Mr. William Schneblin on if somebody from in the chat needs to ask him about co-masonry this Saturday night, and we'll get Bill talking about that because he was involved in it, and it involves both men and women. And as you might imagine, with this type of folks, what went on in these meetings. But Henry Steele Alcott, William Q. Judge, and Helena Protrobna Blavatsky formed the Theosophical Society. And the emblem of the Theosophical Society is the hexagram with the snake swallowing its tail around the hexagram. And for those of you that saw the program last Saturday night, we put up the symbol of Eliphas Levi, of the what he called Black Jehovah, White Jehovah. No, okay, these are two different symbols. They do have similarity of the hexagram in them. However, they represent two completely different things. For example, for Eliphas Levi, 
It was the great symbol of Solomon, the double triangle of Solomon, represented by the two ancients of the Kabbalah, the macro prospus and the micro prospus, the god of light and the god of reflections, of mercy and vengeance, the white Jehovah and the black Jehovah. It doesn't have anything to do with Satan. It doesn't have anything to do with the Holy Spirit. And no, it is not blasphemous. And this was also the seal of Solomon, the hexagram with the circle around it, the snake swallowing its tail. And we read the scripture about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And we read the explanation from Eliphas Levi and from Albert Pike. What would Albert Pike have to do with this? It doesn't have anything. This has to do with your supposed association of Albert Pike with the Luciferian, which is part of the Taxel hoax. Again, I will put a link below to this so people can find out much more information. But no, Albert Pike didn't have anything to do with this symbol. And from Rex Hutchins' Bridge the Light, published by the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite. Doesn't have anything to do with the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite. How this was explained as being the Holy Ghost. This snake swallowing its tail around the hexagram. And this is blasphemy. No, that's your interpretation, and your interpretation is grossly incorrect. And anyone with an ounce of the fear of God in their life uh, would not do such a thing. It's just uh, absolutely over the top to in any way play nice with this satanic blasphemy. That's all it is right out of the pit of hell. There are not words to express how evil this is. How is it evil, David? What are you talking about? Why is it that what you don't understand you fear and thus it's evil? You espouse to be somebody who understands this, but you don't. You don't understand it. You don't understand it from their perspective. You only understand it from your perspective. So you are not opening your mind to this. You are actually closing your mind to this. You're a bigot. But the mantle of theosophy passed to a woman by the name of Annie Besant. And there's a picture, and now someone there is sharing the theosophical symbol. Okay, David, someone is John Pounders, who's going through all these images and trying to find them for you and put them up on the screen. He's not someone. And if someone, there's a picture of Annie Besant in her Masonic regalia, and... That is Mr. Leadbeater and Annie Besant. And uh, we did have a picture of uh, Annie Besant. And I apologize, we're, our visuals are just not working tonight. <laughs> They're working just fine, David. It's, it's just that your lack of patience is, uh, <laughs> is not being considerate of him. He's going through the images. He's trying to find them and put them up on the screen for you. But there's a picture of Annie Besant in her Masonic regalia and uh, in her co-Masonic robes with some of her other co-Masons. And C.W. Leadbeater, who was also a 33rd degree Mason, and he was also a Catholic priest in the old Catholic Church. <laughs> No. Again, there's links below to C.W. Leadbeater. He was, yes, he was part of the Anglican Church, and then he left it for the Theosophical Society. But no, he was not a Freemason, nor was he a 33rd degree Freemason. Which I believe also our good friend William Schneblin was involved in. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in this entire world that William Schneblin doesn't claim that he was a part of. So... The progression came down from the Theosophist, from Blavatsky to Besant and Leadbeater, all Freemasons. No, the only person who was actually a Freemason was Annie Besant, and she was actually a part of co-masonry. And they published, Madame Blavatsky published what she called Lucifer Magazine. And what she taught was Luciferian dualism, that the devil was just God being bad, as Eliphas Levi put it. No, they did not promote this, nor did they print this anywhere in any of their writings or on their website. Eliphas Levi also did not claim this. That there was, uh, and, and actually what they believed is that the true God was actually Satan. And 
they were Lucifer worshipers. They were Luciferians. No, that is not what neither the Theosophical Society promoted nor what Eliphas Levi promoted. And after Mrs. Besant and Mr. Leadbeater uh, passed from the scene and went to their inglorious reward. That's rather callous, you mean, when they passed away? A young lady by the name of Alice Bailey became the queen of the New Age movement. And Alice Bailey wrote two dozen books. And in these two dozen books, she outlined the instructions for the Luciferian disciples in the last days to implement the Luciferian plan. And they're very specific, and that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, the specific things that Alice Bailey outlined for the transformation of the world and the transformation of our nation. And we're going to go through these 10 points, and then we're going to talk about how they're implemented. Okay, so now we get to the heart of the matter. So this is this 10-point plan. It has been, it's been copied and pasted in Facebook groups, websites, blogs, videos, everywhere. But no one gives any source to where it came from. They do not give the books that supposedly this plan came from. They don't give page numbers. They don't give direct quotes. They don't give footnotes. They don't give any information on the origins of this. It is almost as if this just popped up and somebody like typed it up on their word program and claimed that Alice Bailey said all these things, but didn't give any source for it. So there's no way to find out where this comes from because it's not sourced. It's just been copied and pasted and copied and pasted and copied and pasted. So I tried to look through Alice Bailey's writings, and the closest that I could find was the externalization of the hierarchy that has been referenced by at least one of these websites. So I looked at the externalization of the hierarchy, and nowhere in any of her books and especially in the externalization of the hierarchy, is this 10-point plan outlined. So this 10-point plan, wherever it comes from, it doesn't come from Alice Bailey. It's just made up. It is to suit and to fit a particular narrative claiming that all of these people are coming together to do this great conspiracy. So, yeah, I will put links down below for this 10-point plan, but no. I have not been able to find any source of this 10-point plan. So if people want to find the source of this 10-point plan and outline specifically where Alice Bailey wrote this, I would appreciate it. Uh, but for my research, I found that no, it's just been copied and pasted and copied and pasted over and over and over again, but there's no actual source for it. So, again, links are below if you'd like to find out more about this. Uh, this is just a quick video. Thank you so much, and blessed be. And the shoot up here is Bill Schnoblin. I chose to become a vampire because it seemed, you know, sexy or something. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, anyhow, I went through about a year or a half where basically I lived on nothing but human blood and Catholic communion. So that's all I ate.